right now. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation of Morning in the Morning, presented by the Rochester Public Library's Local History and Genealogy Division in partnership with the Friends of Mount Hope. Today's presentation is a nation of joiners, ritual regalia and the history of fraternalism in America with a Dennis Carr. From the early 19th through the 20th century, the symbols and emblems of secret societies and benefit organizations appear on monuments in Mount Hope Cemetery. By the 1920s, half of the entire population of the United States belonged to at least one secret order or fraternal benefit society. Although their practices and ceremonies can appear silly today, these organizations played a vital role in the culture of their time in providing social safety net benefits, pre-digital age networking, and powerful lobbying efforts for their members. We will explore the evidence left by these groups in Mount Hope Cemetery and across American culture. Today's speaker is Dennis Carr. Dennis is a founding member, past president, and current trustee of the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. He is the senior tour guide at Mount Hope, with 2021 marking his 43rd year leading tours of Mount Hope Cemetery. He is currently vice president of the Friends of Mount Hope. Dennis is also on staff at the Edward G. Minor Library at the University of Rochester Medical Center assisting students, researchers, clinical staff, and faculty. He's a lifelong scholar of the American Cemetery. Without further ado, I turn it over to Dennis Carr. Okay, well, you know, you, you really, you can't, uh, you can't really throw a stone in Mount Hope Cemetery and not hit something that has, that, you know, doesn't have a, a fraternal symbol on it. And, uh, you know, I, I think, we don't, most people don't know an awful lot about these, these organizations. And what we do know comes from uh, popular culture. You know, uh, those of us of a certain age remember Jackie Gleason and the Honeymooners and he and his friend Norton would go off to the Raccoon Lodge. Uh, and it, uh, you know, their uh, activities were sort of silly and their uniforms were sort of silly. And they, they you know, they had a salute, they waved their their, uh, the tail of their hat and, and howled, you know, at the beginning of the meetings. And, and uh, um, a little bit later, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s, Everybody Loves Raymond was, was on TV. And uh, the father, Frank, would go off to the Caribou Lodge. And all we really knew about, about what the Caribou Lodge did was that they, they, they drank and they, they had a pool and everybody swam naked. And that's pretty much all we knew about the the Caribou Lodge, and it was it was silly, and it was uh, um, you, you know there are lots of movies that uh, that uh, um, have have pieces in them about about these fraternal organizations, and and I guess they do seem silly in uh, in in the current time, but in the in the nineteenth and uh, you know first half of the twentieth century, these were really serious organizations that did. Uh, uh, culturally necessary things. And uh, we, we can really go back to the start of this um, with this landmark Supreme Court case, Dartmouth College versus Woodward in 1819. And uh, uh, one of the trustees of Dartmouth College uh, sort, of, sort of decided for himself with some help probably from some, uh, some friends that uh, Dartmouth College, which had a charter from, from the state of, of New Hampshire um, should, should become a public university. And uh, the other trustees disagreed, but his argument was that uh, since the uh, state had issued the charter for this, that the state had uh, the authority to change that charter. And uh, um, this went to, went to the court, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that uh, no, in fact, that charter, although it was issued by the state, it was a contract, and that you you, you know only the only the uh, uh, people uh, that had contracted in that contract could change the contract. So so it it and it, this sort of sets the stage for the whole idea of of incorporation and and uh, you know these state chartered um, entities, and that uh, that that gave cover to. Uh, not only not only businesses, but uh, but not for profit corporations as well, and really, really in um, just sort of significantly for uh, what we're talking about today, one of the very first not for profit corporations in the United States was actually a, a 
a cemetery, the Grove Street Burial Ground in uh, New Haven, Connecticut in 1796 was, was uh, incorporated as a, as a not-for-profit corporation. Maybe the first time that anybody had, uh, had done that. So, so Dartmouth College versus Woodward sets this all up. And then in the early 1830s, uh, the, uh, the French diplomat, Alexis de Tocqueville comes to the United States, ostensibly to study the American prison system and uh, ends up sort of, sort of taking a, a, an outsider's look at, uh, at, at the culture and governance of the United States. He wrote this book, Democracy in America, that's a, a canon in the field of, of American history. And, uh, and he's sort of the guy that coins that term, a nation of joiners. He noticed that uh, unlike, unlike Europeans, Americans tended to uh, band together in these, in these organizations. And uh, um, he said that uh, um, in Europe, there already were organizations like this, but they were headed by a, an aristocrat and the, and the organization was, was pretty much uh, mandatory. You know, if you saw um, Downton Abbey a few years ago, you know, that, uh, that the, uh, um, you know, Lord, uh, the Lord is the, uh, the head of sort of the community that surrounds the manor. He's, he's really the landlord and, and nothing really happens without, without his uh, patronage. Well, in the United States, we don't have that. And the government at that time, fairly weak federal government, and uh, people began to band together to uh, um, get the things that they thought necessary. You know, uh, you know, we. What amazed De Tocqueville was that this country that was built on individualism, they, people tended to band together at the drop of a hat for for all sorts of different causes that uh, that they felt strongly about. And uh, um, once again, the basis of these fraternal organizations, people are banding together to get uh, something that the government at that time didn't provide. Uh, and and really the 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 grandfather of all these organizations is, is the Masonic Lodge. And you walk through Mount Hope Cemetery and any cemetery really, and uh, maybe not maybe not so much the Catholic cemeteries, but but you'll see this this symbol, the square and compass that represents the, uh, the Masonic Lodge. And the Masonic Lodge uh, goes back to, depending on who you talk to, and there's argument about this, but it goes back to the, to the uh, um, Middle Ages and the uh, stone maze form form this this sort of a, a organization uh, for stonemasons but in the in the uh, 18th century it, it becomes this this more more general more idea-based organization and uh, um, it tends to be made up of the movers and shakers people are banding together in the Masonic Lodge it's a secret society and it sounds pretty it sounds pretty grim when you when you approach it like that, but it really was it really was based on on mutual benefit and uh, coming to the aid of your your fellow uh, lodge members and and they they got off in the weeds a few times in the in the 18th century between the early 1730s and, and about 18 or about 1750 um, it went out of favor because they had uh, one of their apprentices, and this is what they called new members of the lodge, uh, was he, he died during an initiation. So there was lots of, uh, uh, lots of people that looked, looked to the Masonic Lodge as this, this negative secret society. But, but you know, uh, mid 18th century, it sort of revived. And by the time of the founding of the American Republic, um, People like George Washington are all members of the Masonic Lodge, and uh, um, and this this square and compass represents what's called the Blue Lodge. And uh, uh, the Blue Lodge had had three degrees. You would you would come in as an apprentice, but then you would go through three degrees, and uh, and the the final degree was that third degree. And uh, You've heard that before, the third degree. We're gonna give them the third degree. Well, that's where it comes from. It comes from the Masonic Lodge because at the when you completed that third degree, you would be aggressively questioned by your uh, fellow lodge, your experienced lodge, lodge uh, members. 
and uh, to test you on, on what you had learned. And so that, that uh, phrase enters the, uh, enters the language, you know, uh, you know, the police are gonna give them the third degree or whatever. And that it comes from, it comes from that, that Masonic tradition. In 1826, uh, the Masonic Lodge in Western New York is pretty active. And there are Masonic Lodges in, in communities all throughout West, Western New York. Um, Nathaniel Rochester, the founder of, of, of our city, uh, is a member of the Masonic Lodge. There was a, a, a Mason named William Morgan who, uh, who lived in Leroy. He was a member of the lodge in Leroy. And, and he had people, it's hard to tell because, because after the fact, people probably were, had an interest in denigrating his, his uh, background. But uh, he claimed to, be, to have been a captain in the War of 1812. And uh, he claimed to have completed the uh, degree process in his lodge in New England. And uh, nobody was quite sure of that, and uh, he 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 must have been a sort of an annoying guy because um, when a new lodge opened up in Batavia, he was refused membership. He was essentially blackballed. Another another term that comes from from uh, uh, the Masonic tradition, you know, if, if you were if you were going to join these lodges, you know, they would the members would. Would go around they put a, either a black or a white ball in a box and if you got a black ball you were blackballed in other words you were rejected from the from the lodge comes from this masonic tradition so uh morgan was blackballed and, and uh, denied uh, membership in the in the batavia lodge and uh he decided to get even and he he decided to print the uh, secret rights of the masonic lodge he he it took him a while to find a publisher for that because most of the publishers were members of the Masonic Lodge, as were all the uh, sheriffs and constables and people like that. And uh, when word got around, and, and he actually did, he actually did uh, give this to a publisher or to a printer, and it actually was published. But uh, um, he started to get harassed throughout throughout the region, and uh, he was uh, arrested. He was in Canandaigua. He was arrested on a trumped up charge accused of, of stealing a shirt from a boarding house uh, there and uh, put in the Canandaigua jail. And uh, that night, the, sh the uh, sheriff was, uh, was uh, conspicuously absent. His wife was, was uh, uh, watching the jail and a carriage pulled up and some men came and bailed out William Morgan. All the, all the while Morgan is, is crying foul. He didn't want to be bailed out by these guys. They were members of the Masonic Lodge and they, they, they had uh, bad intentions. They, uh, they basically kidnapped him out of the, out of the jail with the uh, uh, blessing of the sheriff. And uh, he was taken out the uh, Ridge Road to Niagara Falls. And, uh, and most people believe that he was, uh, he was dumped into the Niagara River and, and murdered. And uh, out of this comes a whole movement, the, the anti-Masonic movement uh, and a political party, the anti-Masonic party uh, against these secret societies. There's a, there's a monument in Batavia, uh, sort of an anti-secret society monument memorializing William Morgan. And uh, um, a, body, a body washed up at the mouth of the Niagara River in the spring of that year and nobody really could prove that it was Morgan, but as one politician said, any Morgan's a good enough Morgan. And they, he it was sort of the symbol of this, uh, of this uh, pushback against the Masonic Lodge. And the anti-Masonic party was born, primarily in Western New York, but across the country. They ran actually a presidential candidate, uh, William Wirt, and, uh, and were fairly successful on the, on the local level, all coming out of this, uh, um, Push back to uh, the Masonic Lodge and its, its secrets, and uh, uh, it wasn't a particularly successful party. But eventually, the the anti Masonic party, the Free Soilers, and a bunch of others, the Whigs, um, all sort of morphed eventually into the Republican Party, which which became a a, a fairly uh, successful political party. And uh, uh, so, if you complete the, uh, the degrees in the Blue Lodge, you're, you're able to go on to uh, any number of other uh, um, Masonic-based 
lodges that follow. And uh, uh, there's the, uh, the York Rite or uh, American Rite Lodge and, uh, and the Scottish Rite Lodge. Those are the big ones, but there's also the Shriners and the Knights Templar and, 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 and there, are, there are others. But the, uh, in the Scottish Rite, there are 32 degrees. And uh, if you, you, you would earn those degrees over, over time. And if you're, if you're a 30, 32 degree, 30, 32nd degree Mason, um, many of those people have this, this uh, um, double-headed eagle on their, on their grave up in the cemetery and, and with the 32 up at the, up at the top to signify that they were a 30, 32nd degree Mason. And you can see, you can see uh, this man also was a member of the Odd Fellows down below. He's got the Odd Fellows, the uh, the seeing eye, you know, the all seeing eye, and the the the, the links of the Odd Fellows. Um, uh, that F L T stands for uh, friendship, love, and uh, um, um, now no, I'm blanking on that, but. Uh, Anyway, anyway, people belong to multiple lodges. Uh, they, 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 you find uh, on, these, on these monuments that uh, um, they may have belonged to three or four of these things. Here, John, John Muggridge, the, he's a, he was a member of the Knights Templar, this extension of, of, of masonry, that uh, crown with, the, with the, uh, the cross over a Maltese, over a Maltese cross. Uh, signifies the Knights Templar, this this um, advanced uh, uh, lodge of, of 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 Freemasonry, and uh, you'll see this all over the cemetery as well. Uh, John uh, J. Hungerford Smith is a, is a great example. He's a he's a uh, uh, where is he? He's a thirty second degree Mason. You can see the symbol on his monument. And, and in this case, his entire monument is a, is a, a Masonic symbol. Uh, when you come into the Masonic Lodge, um, you are referred to as, uh, as Ashler. You are, you're rough. And, and the base of the monument is this Ashler representation. But sitting on top of it, for really no other reason than this Masonic connection, is this, this huge uh, polished granite cube. And the cube, and particularly this finished uh, cube, is is the symbol of perfection in the in the Masonic lodge. So, in the Scottish Rite, when you achieve that thirty second degree, you've achieved perfection. And and in in the case of J. Hungerford Smith, this this uh, uh, it's about a uh, three foot by three foot by three foot uh, cube of of polished granite. To give you an idea of the scale of the thing. There it is, and uh, um, so he achieved that, and uh, so he's said to have achieved perfection in the lodge, and that uh, his his entire monument represents that. J. Hungerford Smith was a was a uh, pharmacist, and he ran a uh, he ran a soda fountain in his pharmacy. He wasn't happy with the uh, uh, syrups and fruit things that 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 he could get, so he, he concocted his own, and a, and a whole company came out of that, and it's still around. J. Hungerford Smith is a, a division of ConAgra, and they still sell these, these uh, fruit syrups and, and uh, uh, things like that to, uh, uh, for ice cream and, and, and for the confection industry. And uh, here's, here's that, that Knights Templar again, and once again. There, you'll see this repeatedly throughout the cemetery. When you see that crown and the and the cross uh, coming out of the crown over that Maltese cross, that that generally represents that that uh, branch of of Freemasonry, the Knights Templar. Here's another another 32nd degree Mason with his uh, double eagle symbol uh, carved onto his uh, his his monument. And once again multiple lodges. And another, another uh, uh, person buried in the cemetery that belonged to multiple lodges. He belonged to the Odd Fellows. He, he was a Mason. He was uh, uh, very likely, uh, very likely belonged to the uh, Knights of the Maccabees, the tent at the top of that triangle. And uh, he's there. 
they're incorporating the, the symbol into uh, uh, one symbol on his monument. Uh, this woman was a, a member of the uh, Order of the Eastern Star, which was the, the female auxiliary of the Masonic Lodge. This organization, the Masonic Lodge, of course, exists, and the, the Order of the Eastern Star still exists. But people were very proud of these organizations. And uh, and uh, they, they not only were they secret societies and social gathering places, but they, they also did charitable works. And... Uh, um, Today, there are Masonic-based hospitals, and uh, the Shriners Hospital for Children is, is Shriners is a, an extension of the Masonic Lodge. And they're, they're, they, they did things beyond the, uh, the local lodges. And, uh, but, uh, but the basis of, of, of the Masonic order is, uh, is mutual benefit. You know, if you... Um, was important to belong to these things, any of these lodges. Um, if you, you lived in Rochester and you uh, suddenly lost your job, and in the second half of the 19th century, that happened a lot with what, what economists and historians refer to as the roller coaster economy. There was a lot of ups and downs, and uh, not a lot of uh, not a lot of government control on the economy. So, so there would be uh, frequent uh, recessions and depressions and things like that. If you lost your job. Uh, and you were a, a member of the Masonic Lodge, you would look to your, your you would look to your lodge brothers to help you uh, get another job, and and they did. Um, there was a, a you know, there, I, I, I read a thing where the, the, a Mason who was a, a manufacturer, he worked in a manufacturing plant, and he said he said that it was it was um, essential to belong to the Masonic Lodge. He said all the bosses are members of the lodge. So if you belong, you're guaranteed to be part of the inner circle. You're guaranteed to hold on to your job when maybe other people lose theirs. Uh, so, so, and 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 there were there were other reasons to belong. There were there were there was insurance and things like that. Um, this is this is down in Buffalo in Forest Lawn Cemetery, a dedication of the Elks Rest Monument in 1914. You can see the the a huge number of people that, that belong to the Elks Club. And uh, um, this is one of the organizations that, you know, after the decline of a lot of these fraternal organizations began even before World War II. And, uh, but by the 1970s, the Elks Lodge was one of the few that, whose membership was still increasing. And it was based on the fact that they had, they had sort of morphed from, from this fraternal organization into more of a, a social club, more of a, you know, maybe, maybe a little more, on the model of say the rotary or something like that and they were still still gaining members i, I sort of doubt that that's still the case but uh there's the monument today and and they have this big plot in mount or in uh, forest lawn cemetery up in buffalo and 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 you'll see you'll see the uh the symbol of the elks lodge on monuments in mount hope cemetery although we don't have a, a dedicated place Another group that another group that you might not have thought of as a fraternal organization is uh, uh, patrons of husbandry, the Grange, and uh, you're looking at the House of Guitars up in Irondequoit in the town I live in, because the House of Guitars is is housed in the old Irondequoit Grange Hall, and every community had a had a Grange Hall, and uh, um, right after the Civil War. Um, um, Oliver Kelly, who was a, a government official in the uh, uh, Andrew Johnson administration, uh, was uh, was commissioned by the the uh, Secretary of Agriculture to go to the South and uh, and 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 do a survey of farming methods in the South, and he was horrified to find out that that a lot of the farmers in the South were using outdated methods and and uh, um, failed methods and 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 uh, certainly inefficient methods. And uh, he really, he, he, he tried to formulate a plan to get these uh, farmers to uh, accept, um, accept, you know, the best practices and, and uh, improve their farming methods. He couldn't get anywhere until he remembered that he was a member of the Masonic Lodge. And, and there were people in the South, of course, that were also members of the Masonic Lodge. So he used his Masonic connections to, uh, to, to get these farmers, to be introduced to these farmers and accepted by farmers. And he started to be able to 
implant these uh, these more modern farming methods in, in, in the southern states. And the, the light went off. And he he's the founder of, of Patrons of Husbandry, the Grange, this organization of, of farmers. And, uh, um, and the Grange was very effective in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And, and, and there still are, are active Grange uh, um, organizations in, in states all across the country, including, including New York. And uh, I last two years ago, I, I, I went to an event out in Orleans County where they had the, uh, the state historian of, of the Grange organization come and talk about the founding of the Grange. But, uh, but, uh, but, but Oliver Kelly, uh, with his experience as, as a Mason and, and his success through the Masonic connection in the South, he organized the Grange pretty much based on the, on the model of, of the uh, Masonic Lodge and uh, uh, with some of the rituals and you can see this, this, this lodge meeting where, where uh, people are, are, you know, doing, you know, have these ceremonial staffs and, and things like that. And they're, so they're, they're, they're operating the Grange as sort of this, this secret society, although it was open to um, pretty much anybody who, who was a farmer. And uh, um, the uh, these are the these are the sorts of things that you would find on, on gravestones. To the to the left is a a, a, a cast iron uh, um, medallion that would that would uh, would be uh, fastened to the to the base of a monument. And then the, the next to it on the right is a pin that you might wear if you were a, a member of the uh, of the, the Grange. And there, this is not in Mount Hope, but there in the center of this uh, monument is the, the symbol of the Grange on a, uh, on a uh, mid 20th century marker. That sheaf of wheat with the uh, uh, P on one side, the H on the other for patrons of husbandry. And, uh, but we know it as the Grange. Um, up until just a few years ago, there was a Grange Hall on uh, Long Pond Road in Greece, right next door to the uh, Grease Ridge Fire Department. And today, the, the Grange is no longer there. They've sold the building off to the fire department. But, but it's a fairly recent organization. And there are Grange, active Grange uh, 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 lodges in uh, Orleans County and, and uh, a lot of the uh, rural counties across New York State. But uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, interesting things about the Grange is that, that right from their inception, they accepted women as full members, uh, equal to the memberships of the men. And uh, in fact, one of the last public appearances that uh, Susan B. Anthony made um, before she could, before health uh, prevented her from, from speaking anymore, she spoke at a, at a, at a Grange convention and uh, had a great appreciation for the Grange because of their, their stance with uh, women members. But uh, um, because, because Oliver Kelly, when he founded the organization, realized that, that women were an integral part of these farming families. They, they much of the time, uh, helped run the farm every bit as much as, as their, their husbands did. So, um, so the Grange was a favorite of, of, of Susan B. Anthony. Uh, Another, another thing you'll see throughout the cemetery, mostly in the mostly in the uh, the southern half of Mount Hope, which which uh, uh, most of the graves date from post Civil War times. They're mostly mostly start right after the Civil War and going into the 20th century. You'll see you'll see this uh, symbol of an organization called Woodmen of the World, and uh, uh, Woodmen of the World was a an organization in the Midwest. They uh, um, they Provided insurance benefits to their members, and uh, and and they had some restrictions. You, um, they they in the 19th century, you couldn't be a, a member of Woodman of the World if you lived in a city, or if you were a uh, if you worked for the railroad, or uh, any number of other uh, jobs that they deemed dangerous. If you were a gambler, you couldn't couldn't be a, a member of the Woodman of the World. Um, they wanted people that were primarily healthy, and uh, and they provided not only insurance benefits, but they provided uh, many times a uh, cemetery marker, in the, as as in the case of this one, and uh, and there's their uh, um, symbol incised into into this uh, marker in the cemetery, uh, Woodman of the World, 
and uh, you know, Wood Men of the World is still around, not as a fraternal organization, but today they're a, a mutual insurance company and uh, still based in in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, um, once again, you know, popular culture sometimes makes light of these things. If you if you saw the movie with Jack Nicholson a few years ago about Schmidt, he was an actuary for Woodman of the World and uh, was just retiring at the time that the movie started. And uh, and and to the left, there's the uh, a Woodman of the World uh, monument that was provided to to uh, one of its one of its members. Um, Another one that you might not think of as uh, as particularly a, a fraternal organization is the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. And uh, the Grand Army of the Republic was a veterans organization that started right after the Civil War. And uh, anybody who served in the in the in, in the Civil War could could be a member. And uh, um, once again, it was more than a social club. All these things I have to remember that that most of these organizations they were more than social clubs. They were um, there were points of uh, networking, as I said, you know, if you were looking for a job, you would look to your, your lodge, lodge brothers. And uh, um, if you were in business, your uh, fellow, fellow uh, lodge brothers would, uh, would uh, think of you first if you were in, in business, a business that they, they needed. And, uh, and, and they provided death benefits, uh, widow's benefits, uh, disability benefits, things like that. Um, by 1906, uh, one third of all of the insurance written in the United States came from these fraternal organizations. And, uh, and at, a, at, a, at a cost that was 1 20th what, what would have been charged by a commercial insurance company. And so, uh, so there were, was a lot of reason to belong to these, to these groups. Um, the GAR, in fact, uh, Pat Corcoran, our president, told me that uh, her her family benefited from the from the the GAR when uh, I think it was her great grandfather or something like that uh, died. The GAR came in and provided support for for her great grandmother and 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 the children, uh, and uh, and and you hear this story over and over again. Um, these groups would participate in the funerals of their members. And, uh, and there was a certain prestige to belonging to any number of these fraternal organizations. Um, uh, even the Catholic Church in, in, 18, in 1865, the Pope, uh, I think it's Pope, Pope Pius VIII, uh, issued a, an order that, uh, that, that these organizations were dangerous to the faith. But, uh, but, but about 30 years later, the, the, the successor Pope recognized that, that in the United States, people, the Catholics that, that were not able to belong to these things uh, were, you know, there was, a, there was a cost to be paid. And so, so in the 1890s, the Pope issued an order that said that Americans could belong to these lodges. They, they, uh, they had to pay their dues by mail. They couldn't attend meetings and that the uh, lodge could not uh, participate in their funerals, but they could belong. And, and, through that same period, starting in the 1870s, the Catholic Church began to uh, start their own groups, the uh, Knights of Columbus, the Catholic Knights of St. George, things like that. And, and today, you know, uh, you see the Knights of Columbus participate in various religious ceremonies in the church, and they participate in the funerals of their members. So, so uh, um, once again, they, they, they were formed and founded to provide these same temporal benefits uh, to their members that uh, that these other organizations had provided for many years. So, um, here's uh, Joseph Bauer. He was a state assemblyman, and he was the commander of the local GAR uh, um, post, and uh, died in 1938, buried in Mount Hope Cemetery, but uh, rode in the uh, rode in the uh, Memorial Day Parade every year, and uh, um, was a proud member of the GAR. And uh, um, the, the historian Arthur Schlesinger talks about these uh, these uh, veteran-based uh, fraternal organizations. And he he even even writing before World War II, um, he 
sort of theorized that that they were not going to be very enduring. And I think he was probably right, even in, in the case of the American Legion and the veterans of foreign wars today. Um, once their group of veterans, and those groups were formed uh, by veterans of the First World War, and then uh, augmented by a huge influx of members after the Second World War. But now those World War II veterans are dying out, and the and those veterans groups are are diminished in their in their membership and in their activities and things like that. The GAR lasted until 1956, when the very last GAR member died, and uh, um, their they they uh, owned cemetery plots and cemeteries actually across the country and those were transferred to an organiz a new organization called uh, uh, sons of uh, sons of Union veterans and uh, in 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 Mount Hope there's a, a, a civil war plot that, that today is owned by the sons of of, of Union veterans and uh, um, the successor to the GAR. Um, These, these organizations sort of declined based on a, on a number of, of things. You know, a lot of the, uh, the New Deal innovations, things like social security, uh, states, uh, uh, workers' compensation laws, things like that, where they became, became less important. And some of the organizations morphed into more into social clubs or like in the case of the Woodman into uh, uh, insurance companies. And there are a few examples of that. And, uh, and they tended to survive. The ones that uh, maintained their, their um, rituals and, uh, um, and the, uh, um, the religious basis that they had, they had formed. Most of them, were, most of them were, were religious, but a little, little more generalized religious. They tend to be, tended to be uh, deists and not, uh, not particularly fundamental religious organizations, but uh, um, they, scared, they certainly scared many of the Protestant and Catholic, you know, Catholic denominations, but, uh, but uh, um, I don't think that's why people primarily belonged. And I don't think they, in, they impinged on, on the church. But uh, um, one of our former trustees, Laurel Gable, wrote about these organizations in the, in the, in the early 1980s. And uh, um, like, you know, maybe, maybe it's analogous to this. Um, you know, there are organizations for everything, including, including the study of, of cemeteries. And, and uh, uh, there's one in New England called the uh, Association for Gravestone Studies. And she, has, she was one of the founders of that organization and, and, and an officer for many years. And, and they put out a publication and she wrote, she wrote an, an article about these, about these organizations in the early 1980s. And uh, as I said, Arthur Schlesinger, the, the historian, uh, wrote about this in in the 1940s, but there there really isn't an enormous body of literature about these uh, about these fraternal organizations. Uh, Schlesinger Schlesinger kind of broke them down into uh, various periods and various movements, and uh, beginning with the Masonic Lodge. But then, um, in the 1840s and 50s, he uh, he identified uh, some of the native nativists. Uh, nativist organizations uh, uh, that rose up, and, and he identified those as as uh, fraternal organizations, and I I, I think he was right, and uh, and they lasted for a while. They were the uh, you know the United American Mechanics, which was a big one, um, Order of the Star Spangled Banner, Brotherhood of the Union, Sons of Temperance, and there were others, and they they tended to uh, they tended to be. Sort of, sort of a timely thing. They're pushing back against uh, immigration at the time because the immigration was in the late 1840s was ramping up with a, a lot of German and, and Irish immigration all over uh, northern and western Europe, and uh, um, and so there was this nativist push, and it resulted in a lot of these organizations. They 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 weren't particularly enduring. The 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 national um, the national centennial in 1876. Spawned another another push of uh, of a, an entirely different type of, of organization, uh, the uh, the DAR and the uh, uh, the Sons of the American Revolution and, and the uh, Colonial Dames and uh, uh, the Mayflower Society and and people like that that were were 
uh, celebrating the centennial of the country by celebrating their own genealogy and their own uh, uh, ancestors participation in the formation of the country. And those organizations are mostly still around, maybe not in the in the uh, uh, size that they once were. Although I know a lot of the DAR ladies and they're, they're, they're a lot of fun. I, I, I find them, they do a lot, they do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things. They do, they provide scholarships and grants and things like that. And they're, they're concerned about, uh, about preserving uh, uh, the study of American history and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, we have a tour at the cemetery every year, uh, Revolutionary War tour, and the DAR and the SAR participate in that. So, still, still active organizations, although the memberships of some of these things tend to be a little older these days. Um, in the 20th century, you started to have an entirely uh, new class of, of fraternal organizations centered around around business and around you know. Um, the Rotary and, and organizations like that. And they come out of this fraternal tradition, but they're more based in, in the, uh, the, the industrial economy of the, of the early 20th century and, and uh, tend to have their meetings uh, at lunchtime. Although I, I gotta tell you, I've spoken to the Rotary in Rochester a couple of times uh, and they, they have breakfast meetings and I had to, had to start at 7.30 in the morning. So, so they, they're still around, still still very active, and uh, um, you know, responding to the needs of their members, and and once again, providing scholarship money and and uh, doing community service projects and things like that all over all over the Rochester region and all over the country. So uh, so so there's this this long history of uh, of of these organizations. The golden age of, of uh, fraternal organizations uh, is between the end of the Civil War and probably probably 1920. Uh, by 1920, more than half the people in the United States, more than half of the population belong to at least one of these, one of these organizations. And, and many people belong to two or three. And I, I, I know of monuments in Mount Hope that have as many as five separate um, symbols for five separate organizations on on the person's monument. People were very proud to be members of these organizations. And uh, and another thing that's sort of gone away, you know, uh, Schlesinger identified um, sort of the uh, anonymity of of large cities and 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 the developing suburbs as one of the one of the reasons these organizations. Uh, um, sort of declined. He basically said, you know, um, there is no uh, prestige to belonging to this if there's nobody to impress. And uh, for a lot of people to live in highly populated areas, they, they become fairly anonymous. Um, I, my grandparents' generation uh, was, was belonged to a lot of these things. My parents belonged to the uh, American Legion and the uh, um, VFW. My father was a World War II vet. My grandfather was a member of the Masonic Lodge and uh, um, and and participated heavily in a lot of these a lot of the organization's uh, activities. So um, I think today, you know, a lot of the things that that these organizations did, like that networking uh, uh, function, are done electronically. Or uh, you know, we have we have other things that we belong to. Um, you know, online organizations and, and, and things like that, that, that uh, they're, they're, you know, you, you might be, you might be uh, not quite the same, but you might be on LinkedIn or something like that. And, and that would serve that networking purpose, or you might belong to a professional organization. In the progressive era at the beginning of the 20th century, you started to see the rise of these professional organizations. And, and a lot of them developed through that time. If you were, a, a, you know, I mean, the, the organization of professional historians began at the beginning of the progressive era. The, um, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of organizations of uh, manufacturers and uh, um, people in business, all of these things. And, and, and they all would have their own um, um, journal to, to uh, uh, 
a professional journal where they would publish best practices and things like that. And uh, and so there, at, at the same time, there was a, a, a rapid expansion of, of uh, serials and, and uh, journal journal uh, journals under these, these very narrow topics. So I think we're still doing this. We're just doing it in a much different way. And uh, with with in this digital age, it's it's much easier to stay connected to people um, electronically. And uh, um, anyway, any questions? Dennis, we have a few questions in the chat. Okay, we go through these. Uh, so the first one, this is from actually Reverend James Swartz has two, a comment and a question. Okay. Uh, he commented early on that the most seen international order of odd fellows, grave maker symbol or emblem is the chain with three links, meaning friendship, love, and truth. Right. Odd fellows are also known as the three link fraternity. And we have seen reports of skulls and skeletons on early odd fellows grave markers. There are, yeah, yeah, there, there, all these organizations have, have multiple symbols. And the Odd Fellows, there is a, a there is a, a a symbol with a skull, and it tends to be fairly early. The Odd Fellows, the Odd Fellows started in in the in the early 19th century. Uh, there was a there was a, 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 a an analogous organization in in, in England, and uh, um, by the by the 18 teens and 1820s, a lot of these a lot of these things were taking place here, but they were they were starting as separate organizations, not not. Uh, as part of the European group, yeah, yeah, we have to remember that uh, we were still we were still afraid in 1820 that the uh, Brits were going to come across the the border from Canada and invade the United States. So, uh, so there were breaks with a lot of these things. Uh, religious denominations broke from their their uh, European roots, and and a lot of these organizations that 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 started here um, may have had. Uh, 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 Precedents in uh, in Europe, but they started as separate organizations. The Odd Fellows started, I think, eighteen nineteen, and uh, uh, and 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 they were, after all, secret societies. And and there may have been some symbolism in the beginning that uh, um, that that sort of highlighted that idea of a secret society. And I think that skull probably is one. But uh, but if you uh, uh, if you if you you can go online and see that there are, are just dozens and dozens of, uh, of symbols, particularly for the Masonic Lodge, but the the Odd Fellows as well. The Odd Fellows have a fairly large uh, plot in Mount Hope Cemetery, and uh, um, and and there was a uh, that one one of the one of the uh, heads of of the national organization is buried right there in in in, in their plot. So. Uh, um, I think there are I think there are a total of three Odd Fellows lots in Mount Hope. Uh, there's a Masonic lot. There are lots for um, other organizations, some of which were not all that enduring. Um, um, there all throughout the cemetery you'll see uh, symbolism for organizations that that you might not be so familiar with. The Knights of Pythias, which tended to be um, what I think originated in. Uh, Michigan intended to be more of a Midwestern organization, but that one also, uh, Knights of Pythias, uh, was a really large organization in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, uh, the uh, Knights of the Maccabees, which which began primarily as an insurance scheme, but uh, but uh, uh, took on the uh, uh, took on the ritual and regalia of the of the uh, fraternal organizations, and uh, um, I. You know, frequently pull out my phone and take pictures of of uh, symbols on gravestones that I don't recognize, and have to go back and and, and look up. And uh, plus, there's a, there was a uh, particularly in the uh, last two decades of the of the 19th, maybe first decade of the 20th century, we'll see people combining these symbols into one one uh, symbol. So you might see a, a what looks like a a unified symbol, but it may be it may incorporate the symbols of, of of some of these Masonic groups and the Odd Fellows and two or three other organizations that they uh, they belong to, and all into one one large combined symbol. And sometimes those are difficult to pick apart. But uh, uh, and then there are things that uh, we don't even think of as symbols. There's a monument in Mount Hope. Uh, 
uh, on the grave of a man who was in the uh, who was in the ice business, and uh, um, and and his monument is this very polished granite base, and on top is this very rough uh, rough piece of uh, of stone, sort of a, a irregular uh, uh, rectile or uh, rectangle rectangular cube at the top. And uh, um, even, his, even his family in later, later times said that uh, it was meant to be an ice cube. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe it was because it turns out he was a member of the Masonic Lodge and, uh, and belonged to that, you know, that fraternity. And uh, it's, it, once again, it's that, uh, it's that Ashler versus perfected uh, um, uh, base. And, uh, and it's pretty clear. You see that you see that throughout the cemetery. Things that don't outwardly have may not have a Masonic symbol on them, but are clearly Masonic symbolism. And uh, one of the reasons that I one of the reasons that I'm I'm still at this uh, 43 years uh, later is because I still find things in Mount Hope that are that I haven't seen before, or that are different, or that uh, uh, require um, some extra study and research. Reverend Swartz also asked, can you provide the book in which Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. wrote about these organizations? Uh, he wrote a paper, actually. He wrote a paper, and it's in the American Historical Review in 1944, and it's called Biography of a Nation of Joiners. Hmm. And it's, it's quite extensive, and it, it, it talks about the origins of these organizations and, and uh, a lot of the things we've talked about today. Yeah. So this next one I find slightly amusing in terms of your comments about Americans fearing the British coming across from Canada. Um, how does the ancient order of Hibernians fit into the story? Ancient order of Hibernians uh, is formed by, uh, you know, immigrants coming from Ireland. And uh, uh, they certainly were no fans of the Brits, you know, and they, there was a, uh, during uh, Grover Cleveland's first administration, there was actually an organized attack on, on, on Canada, this, this uh, Fenian rebellion, it's usually referred to. And it was, it was you know, people who had come from, from Ireland, uh, particularly on the Niagara frontier, and, uh, and a lot of them Hibernians, and uh, um, they had some strange idea that they were going to uh, mount this military attack on Canada. Grover Cleveland uh, uh, did not support it. Nobody supported it. Um, uh, and they sort of did it, but uh, most of them were captured by uh, Canadian authorities. So even, even that late in the 19th century, there was some tension on the, on the border. I think, I think Fort Ontario in Oswego was, was an active fort until well into the 20th century. Yes. So. But but the Hibernians were a, were a, a, a large organization uh, uh, founded by immigrants from from Ireland. So so post Civil War that became a, a large organization. And there were others. There were you know B'nai B'rith was a, was an organization. It was a fraternal organization founded by by uh, American Jews. And uh, um, uh, Prince Hall. Uh, Prince Hall was a, an African American. He was a free black man in New England and uh, applied to, uh, to become a member of the Masonic Lodge in Boston and was turned down solely because of his race. And he, found his, he founded his own group, the Prince, Prince Hall Masons. And that group uh, extended throughout, th throughout the country, mostly in, mostly in large cities in the North. And uh, uh, and you'll see that uh, symbol on graves in Mount Hope. Um, so there was a there was a an ethnic component to some of these organizations, and uh, um, uh, there's there's uh, uh, there's 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 a small plot in Mount Hope um, uh, for for African American veterans of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and they formed an organization. It didn't last very long, but they had time to buy this plot and bury their members in in this plot in the cemetery. So so you know a lot of them there were there was something like from from the beginning of the 19th century until 
probably the 1920s, there were more than 2,000 of these, or, these fraternal organizations that formed, and uh, uh, about 800 that were around for any length of time. And, uh, uh, and there aren't nearly that many today you know, that, that have survived that, that same form. But, uh, but you'll, see, uh, you'll, you'll see that there is an ethnic component to this. Um, the uh, Polish Falcons is another one that, that formed in the, in the very late 19th century, early 20th century uh, for Polish immigrants. And, and you, they could go to these organizations, they could, they, um, you know, they, 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 they come about at the time that the settlement houses are being uh, uh, founded in, in, in cities, mostly cities in the north, you know, uh, Jane Addams and Hull House in Chicago and the Henry Street Settlement in New York. And, <coughs> excuse me. And, and they're, 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 those, th those settlement houses are founded at the time when there's a, a lot of uh, immigration from, from Eastern and Central Europe and Southern Europe. And, uh, and now, unlike the, uh, unlike the Irish and the English and, and even the Germans to some extent, there, um, there's this language barrier. And uh, so these people could, could, they could, they could go to the settlement houses and, 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 and access services there, learn English. But at the same time, they, they could go to these fraternal organizations that were a lot of them ethnically based and, uh, and, and they could talk to people in their own, in their native language and uh, be part of an organization that, uh, um, that uh, um, they were comfortable in. So, so yeah, there were, there were lots of them beyond the Hibernians. There were lots of ethnic based um, fraternal organizations. Yeah. So we have a question from Laura O'Donnell. <laughs> Could you explain the background of the International Order of Odd Fellows? Supposedly, my great grandmother was the last IOOF member buried in Mount Hope. Um, well, <coughs> she may have been the last buried in the plot in in their their main plot. I think there are still there's still Odd Fellows in Rochester, and they're probably still being buried in Mount Hope. But uh, but maybe 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 her her grandmother was the last one buried in the Oddfellows plot, and that's that's certainly likely. But the Oddfellows started in England as a group that would, it's mostly a benevolent group. They they would take care of, um, they, they would they would take anonymously take care of the poor. You know, they if if somebody was had fallen on hard times, they would they might uh, uh, anonymously provide assistance to that person. And and uh, and the the Oddfellows in the United States started started. 1819, and uh, along the same lines, but but more on the basis they, they they started more on the model of the Masonic Lodge. You know, um, people people really resisted the Masonic Lodge, um, and and I think I think the prevailing idea is that it was you know they they didn't like the Masonic Lodge based on on the secrecy, and and uh, I think there's a fair amount of evidence that that's not the case. Wasn't the secrecy they 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 disliked? It was the exclusivity, you know that that they couldn't necessarily belong, and that's why they that, that's why they organized their own their own organizations. And the Odd Fellows is a good example of that. It's often referred to as the poor man's Masonic Lodge, and uh, um, so a lot of the you know there they have the, the Odd Fellows had a series of degrees that you could earn, and they had symbols, and, and it was a secret society. And uh, and performed a lot of the functions that the Masonic Lodge had. You know this this idea. You you would if you you couldn't be connected through the Masonic Lodge. Well, you had your own group through the the Odd Fellows or whatever. And and a lot of your social life would would be uh, uh, you know be tied up in the in the, the fraternity. So a couple more questions have come in. Uh, this one is from Nancy Zimmer. Have you heard of the Independent Order of Foresters in Rochester? Yes, and there, there are a number of organizations uh, based around the idea of with that using that that term forester, and uh, um, uh, but yes, there there was a there was a fairly large organization called the Independent Order of Foresters, and you didn't have to be out cutting down trees to belong to that. Most of these were most of these were. Um, 
based on on some symbolism that came with that uh, title, and uh, uh, and and I, there are there are symbols on monuments. I, it escapes me just what they are, but there are there is a symbol of the Independent Order of Foresters, and you do from time to time see that in the cemetery. I know, um, you know. You can walk through the southern end of the cemetery, and 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 you you won't walk more than 20 feet without seeing the uh, symbol of some organization, some that you can figure out, and some that take a little more a little more time. Uh, this one is from Patricia Corcoran. Mm -hmm. Were Jewish people allowed to join the Masons and Odd Fellows? Yes, uh, there there actually there actually was, and maybe still is. A, a Jewish Masonic Lodge in Rochester, and uh, there, there, these are the Masonic Lodge had this religious component to it, but it was it was sort of uh, general enough that it, it even even uh, allowed for uh, the Jews to join. You know, the Jews could comfortably belong to the Masonic Lodge and not feel like they were um, betraying their own faith. Uh, but yes, there there were there were certainly were were Jews that. Uh, um, that belong to the Masonic Lodge. There is a uh, there is a, a very interesting monument uh, in Mount Hope Cemetery that's sort of this big, big double sort of tower, and on that it's 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 one of the first it's it's on the grave of one of the first Jews to arrive in Rochester, and and, and there's a very prominent Masonic symbol on that on that monument. So yes, the Jews could belong. It was the Catholics that were precluded from belonging to the Masonic Lodge, and. Uh, um, I, I won't say that no Catholics belong to the lodge, but they certainly wouldn't have broadcast it if they did. Um, and, and it wasn't until the uh, it wasn't until late in the 19th century that they they with the blessing of the Vatican could belong to some of these organizations, not the never the Masonic Lodge. They always the, the Vatican always saw the Masonic Lodge as as uh, dangerous to the faith, as they as they put it. Uh, if you don't mind me adding something quickly there, when it comes to Mason the actual Masonic um, mythical history, they trace their origins allegedly back to Hiram, the Mason who built Solomon's Temple. So the Jewish yeah. element is their very beginning of their own uh, sure. mythical origins. Sure. Um, another one from Reverend James Swartz. Is everyone aware that the Auditorium Theater in Rochester is part of the Masonic Lodge building? which shows how active the Masons were at one time and that they built the Hugh building on Main Street. Yeah, yeah, the, the auditorium theater was uh, was the theater on one side and it was, it, it had a, uh, uh, basically an office building, but it had a huge Masonic temple within the, within the building, you know, and, uh, um, and that was, I, I, I'm sure that is testament of, of the, uh, uh, the size and influence of the Masonic Lodge in Rochester and cities all across to the United States. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little personal story. Uh, when I was in ninth grade, I got kicked out of the band and uh, in high school and uh, for, for probably not a great reason. It wasn't anything that I did, but I, I wasn't able to come to a, a, an event and I got kicked out of the band. And that night, uh, the phone rang at home. My mother picked it up and it was my grandfather who already knew that I had been kicked out of the band. And uh, my mother said, your grandfather wants to talk to you. And so I got on the phone and he said, uh, do you want to be in the band? And I said, well, yeah. He, he said, well, tomorrow you go talk to Mr. Mack. And I said, well, what should I tell him? He, he'll already know, he said. So the next day I went to talk to Mr. Mack. Mr. Mack said, uh, Mr. Mack was the assistant principal. And he said, do you want to be in the band? And I said, yes. He said, well, you know, band was seventh period every day. So he said, you go to band at seventh period. And I said, won't Mr. Landers uh, be upset about that? He said, Mr. Landers will be fine. So I went to band at seventh period and everything was fine. I'm back in the band. And I, I really didn't understand what happened there. But a number of years later, I found out that my grandfather belonged to the Masonic Lodge that the assistant principal and half the school board belonged to. So I was back in the band. 
and that's that's sort of that's sort of what happens if you don't you know uh, it, it, a number of years ago you would see uh, you would see people with a little Masonic symbol on the back of their car and that was meant to be a sign to other Masons if that if they saw that car broken down along the side of the road they 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 had an obligation to stop and 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 assist that that fellow Mason and there's this this mutual benefit and my experience with the band is just a minor thing that uh you know like i said if you were um if you were uh in business and you had a problem you would you would be assisted by your 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 lodge brothers and people like that and uh and and that was the basis of that secret society and uh, uh the beginning at the at the beginning of the country you know uh, most of the movers and shakers were members of the Masonic Lodge. Um, so, any other questions? We do have some more questions. Uh, this is from Teresa Carroll. Do you think these organizations played a part in holding back against national health insurance back in the day? Um, I don't think that. I don't think in the in the heyday of these fraternal organizations that that anybody had any illusions about national health insurance. Um, I, I think that's a, I think that's a, at best, I think that's a late, later 20th century uh, phenomenon. I, I know that, uh, I know that there was the first I'm aware of any talk about uh, uh, a, a national health plan is in the Truman administration. And then and again, in the Nixon administration, but, uh, but I, I don't think that, I, I think that the reason these organizations provided these benefits was because there was a, a void there. They, there, was, there was no uh, systematic way that this happened. And uh, so they, they provided that, uh, that uh, insurance or that, that health care or whatever, the death benefits and things like that, or even, even the cemetery markers. Just an interesting thing to point out there. The first, uh... I've read a book on the history of health insurance in America, and the first proposed national health insurance system was under Theodore Roosevelt, which I'm not surprised. Progressive era, you know, and that would that would make all the sense in the world. Um, it just it just seems like it's probably uh, probably less of a, a serious proposition until late in the 20th century. Yeah. And, and particularly, particularly in the 19th century, where you had a, a much more dispersed population, people out on the farms, and and you know, uh, farming was a major industry, and uh, uh, and these people were um, more isolated. They they had fewer opportunities to uh, um, uh, to get that sort of health care or that sort of insurance, and uh, belonging to these organizations that uh, that you know, many times had something to do with their ethnicity or their, their affinity or, or their profession uh, was, was an easy way to access those benefits. Yeah. Our next question is from Neil Jacek. Excuse me if I mispronounced your name. Uh, isn't masonry associated with free thinking? Um, I, I, I think it may be, but, uh, um, and, and I think they, I think they promoted um, education in, in all uh, aspects, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not 100% sure about how to answer that. But it's interesting, yeah. Uh, the final question we have in chat at this time is from Sandy. Mm -hmm. Are there graves still available in any of these fraternal plots? Um, I'm not aware of, I, I think the Oddfellows plot is filled. The Masonic plot is filled. I, I don't believe there is. Um, I, I think the, 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 the Oddfellows have more than one plot. So there, there, there may be, but they would be controlled by whichever, um, whichever um, lodge had, had purchased them in the first place, you know. But I don't believe that, I, I would say probably not. Okay. Do we have any additional questions? We have some time here if anyone has anything else to ask. Feel free to jump in and chat if you'd like, or uh, turn on your camera and mic and join us to talk.
you know, the, the, the other aspect of this, this whole subject, the, the whole idea of labor unions in large part comes out of these fraternal organizations. Uh, the first labor unions, the Knights of Labor and uh, uh, organizations like that, these uh, organizations that were meant to represent broad categories of workers, um, they, they began at, at with sort of the same, uh, on the same model as a lot of the uh, fraternal organizations that were active at the time. And, uh, um, and, and with the support of a lot of these organizations, because a lot of these fraternal organizations, uh, their membership were, you know, of that, you know, working class. So they, they benefited from the idea of a union. And uh, some of the some of the fraternal organizations actually supported the idea of of uh, unions in the United States. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple more things come in. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also from Teresa Carroll. Did the Quakers ever join any of these organizations? Um, don't know. Don't know. Okay. Um, interesting. Interesting topic. Yeah. And uh, Reverend James Swartz makes an interesting point here. The statue of George Washington in downtown Buffalo shows him wearing his Masonic apron. Yeah, and 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 the Masonic Lodge made, uh, uh, you know, they 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 got a lot of mileage off of the fact that that uh, Washington was a, a a member of the Masonic Lodge. Um, I know that there are there are cemetery there are, there are mostly turn out to be memorial parks. You know, the memorial park is this. Uh, iteration of the cemetery that begins in you know post World War One, uh, mostly with uh, flush mounted uh, monuments and things like that. But they, um, there are some, uh, there are a number of of memorial parks that are uh, sponsored by the Masonic Lodge. Uh, so they're Masonic cemeteries, and they, the one thing they have in common, they tend to have, they tend to all have a statue of George Washington with his Masonic regalia on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had one other question come in. Uh, can you comment on Workman's Circle? Workman's Circle? Um, probably not. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it, but uh, I, I, I don't know a lot about it. Perhaps the person with the question uh, knows more than I do about it. Um, actually, Dennis, we have papers from the Workman's Circle of the library. Do we? Do we, yes. Uh, do you know yeah. anything about, about the Workman's Circle? A little bit. Um, I actually spoke when they, we took them in while I was working at the library, and <clears throat> the granddaughter, I believe, of the founder in Rochester mm -hmm. um, was the donor. So I had the chance to learn some things from her. Um, basically, the Workman's Circle is a Jewish labor-oriented fraternal organization. It's not a labor union. Mm -hmm. um, very strong in New York City, but someone who'd been involved in the organization in New York City, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name, uh, Cohen was the last name, came to Rochester and brought it here, uh, founded it as an organization amongst the large um, population of Jewish garment workers in Rochester. So it was very strong in Rochester from slightly before World War I until around the 1950s, 1960s and the decline of the garment workers or garment industry in Rochester. Interesting. Unfortunately, most of the materials that were donated to us are in Yiddish. So I'm not able to get much out of them. I still need to reach out and try to find someone who could translate them for us. Sure. Once again, there's this, this ethnic component and there's a value to people in, in, in you know, who, who may not have great command of the English language to uh, uh, band together and uh, and and be able to uh, affect some change, despite their their limitations. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple more comments. I want to get out here. Uh, this is from Carol Santos. Uh, daughters of Eastern Star, many young women, and De Moulet for young, teenage boys in the 1960s. They right. provided a substitute for sororities and provided social outlet and high standards for members. Yeah, the uh, I, I know that I think I know the DMLA is still is still uh, active in places. There's actually I think a, a DMLA camp, a uh, youth camp out in Wayne County. I think up on the lake, and uh, um, and and the, the uh, 
yeah, Order of the Eastern Star was the female um, component, and they had a, a, a youth branch as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of these organizations would have a, 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 a branch for younger people. The, the Grange actually did, although the Grange was unique in that it accepted members uh, from 14 years old on. Mm. And, uh, um, but a lot of these organizations would, they, they're, they're very far sighted in, in wanting to involve uh, younger people in these organizations and, and get them started. But yeah, that's, that's, that's a phenomenon you see a lot with a lot of these different organizations. Um, another an organization that got commented on, this is from Nancy Ufendel. Mm -hmm. Excuse me if I mispronounced the name. Uh, Shriners are still active in Rochester. Yes, Before COVID and when restrictions are lifted, they have car shows at their temple on Bay Road on Friday nights with food available, fish fry, burgers, hots. Uh, they're starting their fish fries to go on Friday nights on February 19th. <laughs> the local Shriners still support the children's hospitals as they did when they hosted the circus years ago. Uh, I used to sell souvenirs with my dad at the circus. We did that as volunteers for over 25 years. Yeah, the, the, a lot of these organizations support uh, hospitals and, and uh, charities, and uh, even still, the Shriners. The, there's a there's a Masonic Research Hospital, I think, in Utica, even today, and uh, the Shriners have a have a big presence in in healthcare. So yes, and and uh, you know those of us of a certain age used to see the Shriners and their little they little go karts in parades and things like that. And they, they, um, but but a lot of what they did, they did for charitable purposes. A couple of additional comments here. Uh, from Lisa Kleeman, it was a wonderful talk. My great grandfather, Theodore Dosenbach, and his brother Herman Dosenbach were 32nd degree Masons. Mm -hmm. uh, learned a lot, learned much this morning to help me better understand their many activities and parades and social gatherings. Uh, if you're not aware, Lisa is the historian of the Dosenbach Orchestra and of uh, much of Rochester's public music in the early 20th century. Uh, we also have a comment from Ronald Wood. That there's a large Masonic temple in Alexandria, Virginia. It's fascinating. A lot of U.S. presidents were members with a large vertical tower visible for miles. I think that's the national. Uh, I think that's the, the seat of the national organization. Yeah. Um, you know, um, talking about the 32nd degree Mason, there actually was a 33rd degree in Masonry, but you couldn't earn it. You had to be, it had to be bestowed on you. So, so 33rd degree Masons tend to be uh, politicians, uh, popular politicians of long standing, uh, people who were uh, um, active in a big way in their community, because you know it would have to be, it would have to be, uh, you would have to get that by, um, by general acclaim, by, you know, by having it bestowed. You couldn't earn the 33rd degree. So, uh, and they use that uses that same double headed eagle. You'll see that on on some of the some of the monuments. What else do we have? Sorry, just reading through the comments we have here. Um, from Jerry Keplovitz, uh, 32nd degree Masons up until a couple of years ago supported the Children's Dyslexia Center, free reading and tutoring. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, through the 20th century, you know, the whole idea of these secret societies and fraternal organizations became kind of a joke, but, uh, but they really weren't because they, they still continue to this day to support uh, some of these charitable causes that, uh, um, that they have for many years. Some of them, some of them they helped found. Mm. <clears throat> Uh, Rose O'Keefe asks this question. I believe this is in reference to the 33rd degree you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that what may have been bestowed on Abraham Lincoln? Most likely, yeah. Um, I think in Mount Hope, I, I, there, there are some 33rd degree Masons in Mount Hope. I think, um, I think that, uh, uh, I, I'm blanking on who might be, but I, I know there are some 
that I come across, but, but they're, th you almost never see a 33rd degree Mason that doesn't have that on his, on his grave marker. Um, um, but yes, there, there are, there are a number of those. That's all the questions we've received at this point. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left here. Are there any final questions anyone would like to uh, ask Dennis? I think George Aldrich was a 33rd degree Mason. He was the uh, political mm. boss in the yes. early 20th century. And we have his papers at the library as well. Uh, Very much an overlooked figure in Rochester history. Yeah, yeah. Okay, a couple final questions popped in. Uh, this is from Gail Wadsworth. My grandfather was a Mason who lived in Holly. He died in the flu epidemic of 1918, but he had a life insurance policy that allowed my mother to attend Brockport Normal School for her teaching certification. It was such an excellent insurance policy that from your presentation, I guess might have been attained through the Masons. Thank you, I'll do more research. Yeah. And another question from Reverend Swartz. What about the moose and eagles? The, uh, the the moose club, the eagles, um, they were they were uh, they tended to be more successful than than a lot of these organizations as we got into the later twentieth century, and that's because they um, they transitioned into this idea of a social club, and uh, there's still moose clubs, you know, um, the elks, the moose. The eagles, they're still they're still around, and I think that's why. Once again, they support they support some charitable causes and things like that, but uh, um, they they try to attract members based on the the uh, social interaction and uh, some of the activities that they sponsor. But they all began they all began on the model of these nineteenth uh, century uh, fraternal organizations. I, I, I have known people that I, I, I used to work with a, with, with a couple of people that belonged to the Eagles Club. There was one over in Gates. And uh, um, a lot of these organizations still uh, exist and are still, still active and uh, still draw members. Okay. Are there any other questions before I wrap things up? Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Well, everyone, looks like we're done with questions. Thank you so much for attending today. Uh, thank you to Dennis for his wonderful presentation, great amount of information, and to the Friends of Mount Hope for helping us to put these programs on. Uh, we have one more program in this season of Morning in the Morning in March. Uh, hope to see you then. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you again, Dennis.